Hi, I'm Dr. Hayley Brosher. I'm a senior lecturer in intellectual property law in uh, the law school. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research today, which is uh, in the music industry and how I've worked with policymakers um, around, on the law around music. So I don't have any slides, there's just one slide. Um, but I am going to try to demonstrate something to you with your involvement, if you are willing. <laughs> so um, if you are able, can I ask you to please stand up? Thank you. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and if the answer is yes, please remain standing. If the answer is no, then you can sit down. It won't go on for very long. So the first question is, do you like music? Excellent. It's always a risky first question, because if everyone sits down, I can't really go any further with that. <laughs> so good. OK. The next question is um, about, so when you say, when we think about whether we like music, maybe we're thinking that we enjoy music. But also, have you ever thought about, for you or say maybe someone you care about, how music actually enhances your life or their life? So with that in mind, do you think that music is something that has enhanced your life in any of the following ways? So you can stay standing if the answer is yes to any of them. If you sit down and then I say one, you can stand back up if you like. Uh, the first one is to do with well-being. So if you think that music helps with your well-being, for instance, it boosts your mood, um, it helps you run faster, if you're feeling sad and you want to purge that emotion, maybe you'll put on a song and do a cry, something like that. Great, everyone's still standing. Um, the, other, the next thing is um, about your actual mental health. So the scientific research that su suggests that uh, music can help people with anxiety and depression. They do studies that show that music can um, affect your hormones, regulate your nervous system, all this kind of stuff. And finally, to do with your physical health. So um, music has been used in rehabilitation um, for people who have experienced, for example, stroke. And they do studies where they compare people who listen to music, people who listen to an audiobook, and people who listen to nothing at all. And the people who listen to the music recovered faster and for longer than the people who listened to the audiobooks or the people who listened to nothing at all. So I'm really happy to see that everybody is actually still standing and no one has sat down. Uh, so you may all now sit down and thank you for your participation. So music is not just important to us as individuals and, and to society, but it also helps us with uh, our mental and physical health. There's also loads of research that talks about how music makes us better people. And that means listening to music and also uh, learning a musical instrument, for instance, can help with uh, memory, but also compassion and understanding, better decision making, all this kind of neurological research is just mind blowing, it's all amazing. But so we're all sta we all stood standing, so we can all agree that um, music is more than just about enjoyment. But uh, the final question really to think about is about how we treat the people who make music and how the law regulates the way that they are rewarded for that creativity that is so valuable to our society. So if you were still standing, I would have asked you, do you think that, well, maybe I need to caveat the question first with, because maybe everybody doesn't know. When a musician or music maker creates a song, they tend to typically license all of the rights in their music to a record label. And when you buy the album, the money goes sometimes 100% of the money, but typically between 100% and, and maybe 90% goes to the record label, and the uh, creator will only receive money from this thing called equitable remuneration, which is, goes around the record label and is uh, paid to them through a collecting society, for instance, when the music is played on a radio or in a cafe or a museum, things like that, okay? So the question is about, do you think that the disseminators of music, so the record labels and the publishers and the big industries uh, in the music industry, uh, are fairly rewarded for their contribution to society? And they do play a key part in um, you know, getting music out there. The platforms, for instance, that we all use to access music plays a big part in the fact that we can all easily benefit from music. 
Um, and if you look at the data, it's obviously subjective, but I imagine that many of us will feel that, yes, they do. They're making millions, if not billions, from the, that side of the industry. Um, some examples would be Sony Music made one billion from streaming income alone in one uh, quarter last year. Um, and you may have seen headlines about certain executives of uh, record labels making um, Christmas bonuses of several million or hundreds of millions. Um, and you could, that's seen across the sector in terms of the, the companies that disseminate the music. Uh, I would put them all under that category, meaning the record labels, the publishers, and the streaming services, for instance. On the other hand, the next, the kind of uh, opposite question, I suppose, is do we feel that we are fairly rewarding and remunerating the people who actually make the music? And I can imagine that you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> uh, in, in my research and the work that I've been doing, um, I feel that the answer is no. And that's partly to do with things such as the way that the music industry is regulated. So one of the things you might have seen in the marketing materials was like more regulation for the music industry. I don't know that I would use the word more, but maybe better regulation. And also not always regulation is not always the answer, but it could certainly help in certain situations. One of those situations being that we now live in the streaming era, and so the way that the music industry makes and distributes money between itself in terms of the record labels and publishers, the disseminators, and the music makers um, needs to adjust. So the way I explain this to my students is, imagine like a game of hockey, and we, we want to play hockey on a, on a field, and we have to have rules in order that the game can play, is safe, and is fun. And so the rules would be things like, oh, let's have a half time because uh, all the players need a break. And we'll have goals, and the aim of the game is to, like, the, whoever scores the most goal will win. You need safety equipment, and you need a stick, all this kind of stuff. So if we want to play the same game, the same hockey game, but we want to play it on ice, we're going to need new rules because the ice will melt. So we have to break three times instead of two times so they can attend to the ice. They make the goal smaller so it's harder to score because the putt will stream along the ice like it won't on the, on the pitch, okay? So for me, the regulation of the music industry is like this. On the field was like the CD vinyl era, and now we're doing the same, we're the same music industry, but instead of playing on the field, we're playing on ice. And ice is the metaphor for the streaming era and new digital technology. So we need new rules. That's my kind of evaluation of the regulation of the music industry. So that's kind of what my research is about. Uh, just to explain a bit more about how I've worked with policymakers in that journey. So um, at the big, was it not down maybe before lockdown? I wrote this book, Copyright in the Music Industry, and um, it's all about trying to help musicians and music makers, artists and performers understand more about their rights. So it's not a referable book. And I think that um, it's something to, for me, it was important to do that. My research is not only about referable journal articles and monographs, which I also do, um, but the picture of that monograph is not on the screen, and I haven't done any policy-related work based on my monograph, and I think that says a lot. I wrote a practical guide uh, to try and engage more with the people who are at the effect of the, the law and regulation that I look at in my research. Uh, then it, we did go into lockdown, and I was like, oh, I'll just make a podcast that talks about the things to do with my <laughs> book, um, for something to do, and a way to not promote the book as such, but get people talking about the topics within the book. Um, and so I started interviewing people from the music industry, including people who were engaged in political campaigns for uh, trying to get fairer rights. So one of the things that came up, for instance, was remember earlier I said about the collecting societies pay the music makers when um, their song is played on the radio. Well, equitable remuneration does not apply when their music is streamed. That means that some artists receive absolutely nothing when you stream their music on streaming platforms, either because they're on a legacy contract, which means their contract existed before Spotify, and so the, uh, the rights holder, which is the record label, doesn't have to pay them anything, 
or they're recouping a debt. So the, if the record company invested in that artist by, for instance, paying for the studio time for them to record their album, they recoup the debt from the, the 10%, not from the 100% that the uh, artist is given. So it takes a really long time and some of them never ever recoup. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the regulation for extra remuneration only applies to radio, doesn't apply to streaming. One of the campaigns that was going on at the time was to try to get streaming encapsulated in that regulation that allows that payment. Because the great thing about that payment is that it doesn't go through the record labels. So it's a revenue stream that goes direct from um, the license payer, which would be the bar or the restaurant or the dentist, whoever is playing music, and straight into the pockets of the actual music makers. So I got involved with that after interviewing people and talking to people on the podcast. Then, partly luck and partly based on the work that I was doing, <laughs> there was a, um, an inquiry by the um, DCMS Select Committee into music streaming, and I submitted evidence to the inquiry, which was um, referred to frequently <laughs> in their uh, recommendations and the report that came out after they um, evaluated all the evidence and um, that some of that was taken forward by the government in the government response, which was really encouraging. At the same time, I also helped, um, so Kevin Brennan, who is an MP who's part of the select committee, he decided to um, sponsor a bill before parliament, which is, it was a private member's bill and he's a Labour um, MP, so wasn't a huge amount of optimism there, but it was a way to push the, com the conversation forward. It was more of a campaign tool than a realistic hoping that the bill would go forward. Uh, but it was based on some of the recommendations in, um, from the inquiry report, and I helped him draft that bill, which was really fun uh, exercise, to be honest. It was like applying my lawyer brain and the, like kind of like writing a contract but the contract applies to everybody you really have to think about like all the unintended consequences and the way that you word it and things like that so the bill was debated in uh, parliament which was great but it wasn't um, evidently um, taken up any further although the government is now undertaking further research into the uh, things that we recommended that they should do so there's still a lot of potential um, progress there other things that have happened, because I mentioned earlier it's not all about law, is that um, they set up a contact group with different industry stakeholders and progress has been made. For instance, two of the three major record labels have forgiven their legacy contracts, which means that they do now pay streaming royalties to those people who were before receiving nothing. So that's really positive. Sure they don't want to come in? <laughs> <laughs> Join us. <laughs> Um, so yeah, th it, that's how I got involved and um, I'm sure if you have any questions about that experience we could talk about it in the Q&A, but that's the kind of thing that I uh, have been working on. I don't have no idea how long I've been speaking for, but I assume my time is up and that is all for now. Great. Great.